everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is a supplemental episode where I try to answer your questions about processing fiber and working with mills and what it's like for mills to process fiber. You guys asked so many great questions during the last giveaway, I thought it was worth an entire uh, kind of like mini episode to try to answer some of your questions. So um, I will dig in and try to get you as much information as possible. And as always, if you're interested in following up on anything we talk about here, you can go over to the blog where I will have show notes for this uh, mini episode and you can follow up there and get more information. So one thing that prompted this, like I said, was your questions from the last giveaway. And so many of you had excellent questions. I'm just gonna put the questions up on the screen if I can, um, along with your usernames, your handles, so that you know if you ask the question um, and how, how it's gonna get answered here. So we've got this long process of um, milling fiber, and, and I'm speaking not from a, the perspective of someone who's worked in a mill, but from the perspective of someone who's processed fiber at a regional mill and um, looked around and talked to folks about like how fiber is processed, um, plus the extra advice that Anne has given and the extra um, answers that she gave to some of your specific questions. So I'm not, I don't know everything, I'm just gonna be able to point you in some directions of places to learn more if you're interested. So, um, Fiber that comes to a mill comes from sheep, first of all, right? So we've got the raising of the sheep to consider, and I've talked about that on here a lot, um, and we had Kathy's sheep out in the pasture this summer. Um, some folks jacket their sheep, and that was one question that I had, um, why jacket your sheep? Um, and that was actually from Chantal, who was one of my test knitters. She's a beautiful knitter, by the way. You should really check out her project pages. I'll put her um, Ravelry name down here so you can go check her out. Um, so Chantal asked about jacketing the sheep, and if you jacket your sheep, you have to um, have a set of jackets for each sheep because as their fleece grows, they need to be able to move around, so you have to like keep putting bigger and bigger jackets on them. Some people say that the jackets are uncomfortable on the sheep because they're hot, and the other danger of jackets is that they can felt the fiber um, while it's on the sheep <laughs> just a little because of the friction between the jacket and the fiber. But the main purpose of a jacket is to make sure that the fleece that you get off a sheep has less vegetable matter in it, less VM, kind of hay, straw, um, little brick bits of burrs and briars and other things like that. It keeps the fleece um, from getting sun tippy, um, where the tips are kind of bleached in the sun. I mean, there are a lot of purposes for having jackets on your, your fleece. Um, so that's, that's kind of like at the beginning of the stage. You're thinking about how am I going to get, create the best fleece and then take that fleece to the mill to have it spun up into the best roving or yarn. Um, then there's the shearing process, and I've talked a lot on here about the shearing process. So um, you want to find a good shearer. Um, we've, we've gone out to shearing at Kathy's, and she's had the same shearer for many years, and actually before he was the shearer, I think his father was the shearer, so there's a long kind of generational thing going on there. And shearers, if they're really good, um, whether they're using hand shears or um, mechanical shears, uh, won't produce things like second cuts. So they'll be able to take the fleece off a sheep in pretty much a single piece and without going back over areas again and again because if you go if you go once over an area and then you go back over the area again to get a closer cut what you end up with are these second cuts which are these tiny little bits of fleece um, that sit on the underside of the fleece when you flip it over you can kind of pull some of them out there are always a few but you want to have a shearer who's good enough to not create a lot of second cuts um, because those are things that'll mess up the fiber as it goes through the milling process um, Okay, Danielle Simpson, Danielle Simpson asked, how do you find a fiber mill? And that is a really great question, because if you are someone who has a bunch of sheep, or you are someone who has uh, collected a lot of fiber, <clears throat> and you're trying to find a place to have it milled, uh, it's a hard thing to figure out, but I've got a couple of sources for you. So I told you that Alina Jordan um, mentioned this book called Fiber Shed, uh, and it just came out in November, and I didn't know about it until she mentioned it, so I was like, I gotta get this and read it. Um, and it's all about kind of like slow fashion, the textile industry, and growing um, yarn and fiber and cloth, starting from the soil all the way through the sheep, you know, through to the milling process, and then on to the consumer. Um, but I mention this book not only because you might be interested in thinking about fiber sheds, which are pretty much like um, areas where um, the sheep are grown, 
the, the wool is grown, it can be milled, all within a kind of smaller geographic area. And uh, I mention it too because Fiber Shed, um, the book, actually has up on um, a website, they have the, um, it's called the National Mill Inventory. And I will put all of this stuff in the show notes if you want to check it out. But let me show it to you here. So the National Mill Inventory gives you a map of the United States. And you can see all these little dots here. And if you zoom in, it'll show you where the fiber mills are in your area. So, and it also gives you some basics. Like there are about 14 fiber mills within this kind of Midwestern region. There are about 32 in the New England region. Out west, there are seven in California about seven between Wyoming and Colorado, and then down south there's like 16 down North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Georgia kind of area. So it gives you the sense of concentration of where those mills are, um, and it's a really useful tool because you can kind of zoom in, go to their websites, and all that kind of stuff. The other thing that Fiber Shed has created is called the, um, the mill, National Mill Inventory Report. And that National Mill Inventory Report is available online as a PDF. And again, I will put um, all the links up in there. But the National Mill Inventory Report talks a lot about where these mills are, how much they're producing, what they're producing, um, and just some of the numbers involved in the milling industry in the United States. So if you're interested in kind of that data portion of the whole thing, Fiber Shed has set you up with some really interesting answers to those questions. Now, as far as Danielle's question about how to find a mill, um, oftentimes uh, folks find mills by word of mouth. So I've been using Stonehenge Fiber Mill um, because I talked to Kathy and because I know that Stonehenge um, can mill the fiber that I've been sending them, which is they need something over, I think, four inches long, maybe over... I think over three to four inches long, something like that. So they're kind of set up, their equipment is set up to mill fibers of that particular length and longer. So if your fibers are shorter than that, Stonehenge isn't gonna be your first best option. Some other mill is going to be. Um, so you're gonna wanna think about like what the possibilities for the mill are. And that often means calling the mill, going to fiber festivals and talking to the mills. And they're usually there, especially regionally. Um, or talking to other farmers in your area or growers in your area, millers in your area, um, who can recommend different mills and people that they've worked with. Um, so that's a little bit of an answer to that question of how do you find a mill. It's a tricky thing um, because you want to find someone you can work with and you want to find someone um, where you know, you're know you thinking about cost uh, per unit ratios and things like that, like how much um, how much fiber can you send them? Can you send them a small amount of fiber? So some mills are set up so that you have to send in, you know, a thousand pounds of fiber, which most of us, you know, as small producers of yarn can't do. Um, but some of the mills are set up so that you can send them as little as three pounds of fiber. Or in my case, I usually send about 30 to 50 pounds of fiber. Um, so you need to find a mill that can kind of accommodate your amount of fiber. And the other thing is if you're trying to make sure that you get back the same fiber that you sent in, which yes, it is an issue. Um, you wanna find a mill that uh, will say to you, we process for small um, growers and we're gonna not just put your wool in a wool pool and give you back yarn of the equivalent weight. We're gonna actually process your fiber separately and give you back your yarn. So that's something to think about. Um, as you interview mill people, as you talk to them, as you um, kind of look around online for which mills might be good or right for your fiber. Um, okay, so then there were a bunch of questions about like, how do you select a fleece? How much do you need? Which I've just answered. Um, what's the blending process? Um, all that kind of stuff. So selecting fleece has everything to do with thinking about the kind of yarn that you want to produce in the end. So as we've talked about on here a little bit, um, different fleece have different properties. Different sheep breeds have different properties um, to their fleece. So you're constantly kind of thinking, okay, well, I want to produce a yarn that has a lot of luster. Well, then you're going to want to go with something like a long wool or a blend with some silk or something else that's going to have that, that quality. And if you're thinking about micron count and wanting to produce a yarn that's maybe close to skin, something that's really comfortable um, for accessories or something like that, then you're going to want to go for a lower micron count and think about um, which mills can process the shorter staple length of your fiber. It's going to might be less lustrous um, because you're not using long wool or silk, um, and so you're just thinking about maybe how you're going to dye that fiber. And it, there's just so many questions to designing a yarn. 
and it's a lot about what's available to you like which sheep breeds are available and then what kinds of yarns you might want to produce with a blend um, for the shorn yarn that's coming out I chose this year to do a gray which meant that I had to calculate and talk to the mill about how many how much white fleece I needed versus how much black fleece I needed to create the kind of gray blend and I know that the mill um, was going to to blend it enough that the gray was going to come through and it wasn't just going to be a mottled white and black yarn. So these are all things to think about. Um, someone else asked about spinning oil in milling and spinning oil, um, I checked out the Green Mountain Spinnery website because they talk explicitly about um, spinning oil. Spinning oil um, is put in, it's a blend of, uh, in their case, water oil and soap and, and citric acid. And it's put in to not only kind of like lubricate the fiber so it can go through the machines, um, but also to keep down static electricity. So if anybody's ever, um, been combing fiber, uh, you know that that fiber can get like whoo staticky really really fast. So if you if you're processing by hand or if you're processing in a mill, spinning oil can kind of keep all of that static electricity under control um, so that you can actually continue to process the fiber. Um, let's see. Someone else asked about worsted or woolen spinning, and this was actually one of the questions that kept coming up, like what is worsted spinning and woolen spinning? Um, for those of you who are hand spinners, you know the difference, yay! <laughs> carding and combing, usually. And carding means that you're creating a kind of like, um, a uh, Rolex or a uh, bat where the fiber is kind of like all going in all kinds of different directions and you're spinning it and you're getting more air into the fiber and so it's a lighter fiber, um, a lighter yarn, but it's really warm because it has a lot of air built into it and that's the, um, the kind of yarn that the Anne is spinning up at um, Blackberry Witch Woolen Mill. The Finger Lakes Woolen Mill is also another woolen mill that I visited um, and they were spinning a similar Kind of woolen fiber and yarn um, and then worsted yarn if you're doing it by hand it's you're combing the fibers you want the fibers to all be going in the same direction in a parallel direction if you're really a stickler about worsted spun it's actually making sure that this the fiber is going into the um, combs in the same direction so the the butt end versus the tip end and all of them are the same so that it's not only parallel but you've got all the butts going in one way and all the tips going the other. That's a really actually worsted yarn. Most of the time at a mill you'll get a semi-worsted yarn um, and Brooklyn Tweed actually has a great post up about um, how they mill their yarn, both the woolen and the worsted yarns. And so I'll put a link to that in the show notes. They go into the specific details of like which machines are used for which in the spinning mill process so that you create that kind of worsted, very parallel, very densely spun yarn on one hand, and then the kind of like airy mass that becomes woolen yarn on the other. So that's, that's one way to answer that question. Um, Someone asked what were, or actually a lot of you asked what were the steps in the process of fiber. So I've talked a little bit about that. There's the wool, there's the shearing, then there's skirting where you pull off all the gnarly little bits around the edges. Usually they're the poop pods, <laughs> places where the the fiber on the, uh, the wool on the sheep was, you know, it got rubbed more, it got pooped on, it got kind of gross. That's all the stuff you want to pull off. And the more of that you can pull off before you ever send it to the mill, the better your yarn is going to be. Um, and the other thing to try to get out of that fiber during the skirting process is any kind of vegetable matter. So hay, straw, little bits of burrs, little bits of stuff. A lot of times you'll shake the fleece out and some of that will come off. You can skirt a lot of it out. If there's a really bad area in the fleece where they, like, they've just been laying in the hay and there's, there's a spot on like where their shoulder would be where there's a lot of um, vegetable matter or VM, I pull that out because the minute you put that fleece in with everything else, that vegetable matter just gets particulated and put through the whole yarn and it's just a miserable thing to see. So you want to get rid of that vegetable matter as much as possible, especially if you're a small um, grower or someone who's going to be um, milling a small batch of yarn. Now, if you're if you're one of the big boys, and you're sending your yarn like to the wool pool, and it's going to one of these huge spinneries, um, oftentimes they will carbonize the vegetable matter, which is a pretty harsh process for the wool to go through. Um, but basically, they they burn off the vegetable matter in such a way that it doesn't quite damage the wool, but it takes care of the vegetable matter so that it becomes carbon and it just kind of flakes out. Um, 
And some people are really not into that process. Um, they don't want to put their wool through it. So I know um, with the mill that I use, they don't carbonize the vegetable matter. So if you put vegetable matter in, you get it back out. Um, and they don't want to put that stuff through their machines either. So they'd much prefer that you skirt that kind of stuff out. Um, so once you get it skirted, send it to the wool mill, then they wash it. Um, and often woolen mills, the smaller regional ones, will just have small stations, you know, uh, top-loading washing machines, things like that, to wash the fiber and try to um, spin some of the water out of it and then lay it flat to dry. And um, a lot of mills say that that's kind of like a bottleneck, like how much they can wash and dry really determines how fast they can work. Because you'll often hear that mills have backlogs of somewhere between four months to eight months to a year, and it, it often is because of that bottleneck of how much can they wash and dry um, and process. Um, so then once it's washed and dried, uh, then it'll be... Um, I like to call it the fluffing room. At, when we visited the Finger Lakes Woolen Mill, um, they just had basically constructed a big box and they were putting the wool through it and they had a machine that would just, like a picker, that would just pull it apart and fluff it up and spit it into this room. And so when you open the door to the room, if it was, you didn't want to do it when the machine was going because it was just fluff, like fiber in the air. And this is why you need the spinning oil um, to kind of like, you know, keep the static electricity down. But there would just be piles of fiber that had been picked, you know, and pulled apart and fluffed just sitting on the floor. And this is for the woolen process, um, woolen spinning. Um, and then all of that fiber can be fed into a carding machine or a couple different carding machines. And it depends on what the mill is going to do, if it's going to pin draft it, if it's going to turn it into more of like a bat style. Um, there are just t tons of different technical things that can happen to it after it goes through that first carding process. Um, but often it would be turned into some kind of roving or um, pin drafting, something like that, that can be fed into a spinning machine. So if you look at roving, um, I don't have any here that I can pull up. If you look at roving that you, if you're a spinner and you have some lying around, it's often made up of three pin drafted um, kind of like spools of fiber. So you can, you can easily divide a braid of fiber into three because it's often the pin drafted kind of put together into a piece of roving. So the roving or the pin drafting goes into the spinning machines and then it's spun into a singles. The singles are left to rest or they're steamed or different processes depending on the mill. And then those are put back onto the spinning machines to be spun in the opposite direction to be plied together. So a singles is just uh, a single ply of yarn and then once you start plying it uh, then you can have two ply, three ply, four ply, etc, etc. And the plying process is kind of like the last thing that's going to happen in the spinning mill before they send back your yarn to you. Um, so that's the basic kind of process. Um, great questions you guys. Uh, somebody asked how you clean the equipment between runs and I know I've talked to a couple of mill operators who have said they run um, They'll run a lot of their uh, white fiber for a while, then they'll do a kind of color batch, and then um, after that point they'll need to clean the whole machine to start over again. Um, and it's, it's quite a process to clean the equipment, so they'd rather not do it. They'd rather run all the whites and then all, you know some, some of the color and then clean the whole thing and then start over again so that it's, it's kind of a pain, I think, to run the colored fibers through there and to clean the machines, as far as I understand it. Um, okay. Uh, Olya Mikesh asked, what's the superwash process versus just regular old wool? Um, so the superwash process is um, something that I'm not going to be able to go into chemically explain too much here, but I have a couple of really great sources for you. Um, one is the Yarn Stories um, podcast, which did a double episode on the superwash process. And the other is Anna of the Dunkelgrun podcast, and she is a chemist, and she talks a lot about the superwash process. Very basically, what happens in the superwash process is uh, if you're using the, I think it's called the Hercoset um, method, you're basically using cl a chlorine compound of one kind or another to um, erode the scales on your fiber. So each fiber from, from wool has little scales sticking up on it if you look at it under a microscope. And those scales are what if you rub them together, they felt. That's what produces felting in wool. And the superwash process is all about, like, how do we not let the fibers felt together? If we put them in a washing machine in a, in, in a dryer, like, if, if we heat them up and rub them together, let's make them not stick. So to do that, you've got to erode off all those little 
um, scales that are on each of the pieces of fiber. And then you've got to coat each of the fibers in a polymer resin. It's basically coat each fiber in plastic. So the yarn that you get, that superwash yarn, has lost many of the properties that um, make wool wool. So it, it won't felt, um, it is not hydrophobic anymore, it won't repel water as well. Um, and that's partially why it, it takes up dye so well and creates these really beautiful, crazy colors. That's a lot of why hand dyers and independent dyers like to use superwash wool because it takes the dyes so well and makes them beautiful. Um, so it's not hydrophobic uh, and it you can throw it in the washing machine in the dryer to a point. <laughs> um, but it's also, if you think about it, it's yarn that's coated in plastic and resin. So there have been some folks who have um, raised concerns about that in our ecosystems, on our bodies, you know, things like that. So you guys know me, I'm not anti-superwash yarn. It, I've used it for a lot of different things. I think it has its place in the yarn universe. Um, but since you're asking about the process, that is what happens. You've got to erode those scales and then coat the thing in plastic so that, or resin, polymer resin, so that it won't felt so that you can run it through the washing machine. That's the basic idea of superwash yarn. And I will put the more technical details over on the blog so that you can check out the Yarn Stories podcast and check out um, Anna of Dunkel Grown who can explain this a lot better than I can. Um, okay. So now we're on to some of the questions that I can answer as someone who's just gone through the process of milling some fiber with a mill. But um, we've got, uh, luckily we have Ann Bosch of the Blackberry Ridge Woolen Mill who was able to answer a couple of your questions that I couldn't. So here we go. So Shauna Stitches asked, how much design goes into the spinning process? Like how much yarn design um, once you get to the spinning stage. And Anne said um, in their early days that uh, they, they kind of thought yarn shop owners would want to design their own yarns, but they were actually surprised that most people just wanted what was on the commercial market. They wanted to produce the same kind of thing that was on the commercial market. Um, so that's what they did for a long time, but they do play a little. And that's, I showed you guys the, um, the color flow yarn. That's one thing that they kind of played around with um, in an attempt to do a kind of knockoff version of one of the commercial yarns. Um, and it really is just a lot of um, technical details and a technical work and understanding your spinning equipment and what its limitations are and what it can do, how far you can push it, what kinds of um, things are possible and where it functions really consistently and at its best, right? So yarn design also means everything I was talking about from deciding if it's going to be a singles to a two ply, three ply, um, what breed of sheep you're using will determine the luster. Um, all those other elements you are going in before you ever get to the spinning stage um, in the mill. Okay, uh, Margarita Deverson asked, uh, what are some of the adjustments made at the mill for various fibers and how adjustable is the equipment? So we're kind of onto that a little bit. And Anne said, uh, up at Blackberry Ridge, uh, they can spin yarns from 5,600 yards per pound to 1,200 yards per pound as singles. So that's the grist of the yarn and that's how much um, uh, yardage you get per weight. It's a kind of technical term that spinners use a lot to try to determine. Um, it's, it's kind of a better, you know, Spencer and I were talking about yarn weights last time and how they're all over the place. Grist is actually one of those things that's, if you use it, it's like the metric system across the board. It makes everything easier because you can actually compare apples to apples using the grist system. So at Blackberry Ridge, they can spin 5,600 yards per pound to 1,200 yards per pound, which is a pretty wide range. Um, and that's as singles, and then they can spin 2,800 to 600 um, as a two ply. So that's, they've got a pretty good range up there, it seems like. Um, and then she said the fibers have their own limits. Uh, you know, she said we can't do a lace weight out of a, you know, medium grade wool or anything coarser than that because the there aren't enough fibers to kind of hold the singles together. Um, and then for their equipment, they can't do slippery fibers like um, straight Lincoln or the Luster long wools or alpaca, which is a totally different beast. <laughs> um, and that's because they're, they're, they're too slippery for the machinery that they have. But if they blend them, then they can go through, you know, with a certain percentage of wool, everything will be fine. Okay, Mar uh, Maria Hughes said, how do mills handle waste fiber? That's a great question. Um, and uh, Anne said that the leftovers from a yarn batch are often put back through the carter and put into roving. So 
Um, she said it's not super high quality roving, but it's still roving. Um, and she said about every batch has about a pound that gets um, returned like that to the customer, um, which is pretty standard, I think, especially for woolen prep. Um, and I know that uh, like the World of Wool, which is a UK company, sells their um, millens, uh, and you can buy a big batch of their millens. Brown sheep companies to sell millens as well. And those are the kind of like leftovers from the milling process. So they're not perfect roving. They're not all, you know, continuous roving. It's like bits and pieces, different blends, um, different size and length of fiber. Um, and they sell that as what they call lap waste botany lap waste or uh, millens, and you can just buy it. They sell it as a kind of byproduct of their milling and blending process. Um, okay, let's see. SM Wilcox asked, how do mills source their fibers for their own lines of yarn? And that is also a great question because I just showed you um, Blackberry Ridge's catalog where they have all of this different yarn that they're offering for sale. Um, so Anne said, um, many years ago we had a customer in North Dakota that had a nice merino wool and I asked him about extra wool. Um, and he had contacts and that's how we got our connected to our merino source. Um, through the years, we've had local people that have had small amounts of wool processed here and when they have extra, sometimes I buy from them um, if I know the fibers are clean and soft. Uh, and she says she doesn't know how other mills get fibers. Um, there are a few mills that actually still have their own sheep flocks, um, but raising sheep, as we all know, takes a lot of work um, and a lot of time, especially during lambing season, etc. So um, they used to raise sheep up at Blackberry Ridge, but they don't anymore. So often it's about sourcing yarn. And if you guys have been out in the blogosphere lately, you've seen Hugh Loco has just put out their woolen line, which they sourced in Colorado and milled in Colorado and dyed in Colorado. So thinking about a fiber shed. Um, and they actually worked with Jen Geyer, who's my buddy out in um, Fort Collins. She helped them source the wool for their line. And so they went to visit the sheep, they found the wool, they found the mill, and she was a huge um, part of helping them figure that out. So if you can find a kind of wool broker or someone like Jen who knows the area and knows the shepherds and knows the wool, then you can help make those connections between growers and people who want to um, design their own yarn and get it milled and work within their fiber shed. And I think that's such a cool project. They have a whole documentary up on it. I'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested in checking them out. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool process to see, again, yet, yet another kind of small batch um, person who's gone out there and tried to capture the value of the wool in their area and get it milled and turned into a process that a product that can be um, sent out into the world. So it's pretty cool that way. Uh, okay, let's see. Diana said, uh, what do you do when the parts break and they're hard to find to replace? <laughs> and I've heard this a lot for um, mills. You know, a lot of the mills, um, if they're not kind of Belfast mini mills where they're using new equipment, um, they're often using equipment that's a century old, you know, on average. Um, so things break, belts break, you know, pieces of metal break, teeth get bent, you know, all kinds of things happen in a woolen mill. Uh, and how do you source good parts? Uh, Anne said that they have a nice uh, machine shop about 30 minutes from there that can repair and make the parts for them. And they really like working with them. I know at the Finger Lakes Woolen Mill, um, Jay was uh, an engineer before he was a fiber miller, <laughs> and so he um, he was able to repair a lot of the machines themselves. Um, I think he had some welding experience and things like that, so he could manufacture some of the parts. Um, and I often hear that um, from the woolen mills that I've talked to, or the wool mills that I've talked to, um, that either someone in the family knows how to do it and is an engineer, or uh, they have a really good contact somewhere who's a, with someone who's a machinist or a mechanic who can fix the, the mill equipment when it breaks. So it's, it's kind of a huge deal and it can slow down production, right? Um, okay, last question from you guys was from Kunin W. And she said, how do you handle pests such as moths or carpet beetles? And that one just sent shivers up my spine. I thought, oh, that's true. You're getting all this wool from all these different places and it might be infested. Oof. So Anne said they don't have issues with carpet beetles up in Wisconsin. Uh, maybe it's a southern thing. Uh, we do have them in Illinois, and they're, they're, they can be really annoying. Um, she said moths are a consistent threat. Every box of grease wool can have moths. If we get wool in that has a good load, we seal it up and ask the customer if they want it back unprocessed or if we should throw it out. And I actually looked on a couple other woolen mills or fiber mill sites, and some of them said if, if there are moth moths in your batch, we'll burn it because there's such a danger to the to the mill. 
Uh, so Anne, continuing with, with Anne's answer, she said, um, for those boxes that have a little contamination, we'll just keep it closed until we can go right into the washing machine with it where the hot water and the laundry detergent will kill the moths. Um, she said she's also tried to use a UV light called Dynatrap, but they're still in the testing stage with that. Um, and that they also just store everything in plastic bags. They store their inventory, that's how they store their yarn, that's how they send their yarn to their customers. And it's how I store my yarn. I mean, you guys see I've got bins back there. I store them in plastic bins, and I know it's not great in terms of people say the wool needs to breathe and sweat and whatnot, um, but I'd prefer to not risk the moths and the carpet beetles and keep everything safe and out of the sunlight so it's not getting hot and sweating. It's just sitting here in this nice temperature-controlled room, <laughs> and that's how I do it. And that's what Anne said she does, too, with the plastic. Um, so that is kind of your tour de woolen mill and fiber mill and you guys had some excellent questions i hope i was able to answer some of them if not all of them um and i'd love to keep the conversation going so i'm going to open up a thread in the ravelry group for those of you who are interested in thinking about fiber mills and mills and questions and i'd love to think aloud with you guys about how to keep some of these mills alive um, that are turning over due to retirement or people getting out of the business for one reason or another um, how do we keep this this industry alive and do we want to. I mean, I want to. <laughs> um, but are there ways that we could work as a community maybe to keep some of these woolen mills alive and running? Uh, so I'll open up a thread on the Ravelry page and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I hope this has been a helpful tour through the mills and uh, I will see you next time for another podcast in the future. Um, thanks for tuning in with me and hanging out. Take care. <laughs>